all you beautiful people of the great free state of New Hampshire. Welcome back to the Carla Garrick Show. It is the new year and I can't wait to spend more time with you. Happy New Year. So we're going to kick off this year with a two-part episode series that I did with Tom Woods. Uh, where, you know, I posted a blog post about my journey towards an alcohol-free life and Tom read it and it obviously resonated with him and so he reached out and we sat down and we did about 40 minutes together. So I'm going to cut this into two separate videos uh, in which I kind of talk a little bit about my journey with drinking and then how I chose five years ago to live an alcohol-free life. If you're struggling or if you're maybe just sober curious or you know you have some New Year's resolutions, please take a look and uh, feel free to reach out. You can find more information on my website, carlagarrick.com, that's C-A-R-L-A-G-E-R-I-C-K-E. -E, and I hope you enjoy this in the first part of a two-part series where I talk about how I beat alcohol. Hey everybody, welcome to the Tom Woods Show, episode 2261, the first Tom Woods Show episode of 2023. After my little break, I was releasing not as many episodes, second half of December, as I always do, take a little time off with the family, well worth it, but now back and raring to go. And what a great episode and topic we have today, because we have the great and brave and amazing Carla Garrick with us, who uh, spent quite some time uh, heading up the Free State Project in New Hampshire, for which she is still one of the primary cheerleaders. Um, you all know about the Free State Project by now, involves relocating to New Hampshire so that if there's a concentration of us who are really engaged and committed, we can make immediate practical steps toward freedom in one particular place. I, I think that's a fair summary of the program. Uh, absolutely. So I would say hi from the frozen chosen up here in New Hampshire. <laughs> well, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to make you feel sad or anything, but we have a high today of 78 where I am. But, you know, honestly, honestly, the cold weather argument against relocating to New Hampshire doesn't hold water with me because I, I love the four seasons and I miss them terribly down here. I, I, I like three months for fall. And I like, I like, you know what? I like some cold in the winter. I want it to be cold on Christmas. By the way, it was kind of cold on Christmas down here. My yeah, kids were, you know, we ordered that Arctic blast. Just to yeah, my kids everybody. were a little surprised, <laughs> but not so cold that they couldn't play outdoors with the things they just got. But anyway, we're going to talk about a completely different kind of topic today. We're going to talk about a non-political topic, but it's of general interest because it's a human interest story and because it involves... Uh, involves you, who somebody who has been prominent in our movement, and I think you have things to say that can benefit other people. So we're gonna we're talking about something I saw you post on Facebook, and and when when you post a link on Facebook, Facebook doesn't like that. It does not like people going off their platform. So if you include a link in your post, it gets much less engagement. So thankfully, by some quirk of good fortune. That blog post that was linked in your Facebook post appeared in my feed, and I clicked on it, and it was about your um, issue with alcohol, where you have been alcohol-free now for over five years, which is absolutely fantastic. I'm happy to say, by the way, I know you were you say in the post that some of your friends had kind of come to associate you with heavy drinking. I didn't. I guess we don't see each other enough. So I never said to myself that Carla, she better get her act again. That that <laughs> thought never occurred to me. But let's let's start at the beginning here with this story because it's fascinating to me how the moment you realized there was an issue and the the role your friends played in it. They didn't sit you down and say, Carla, we have to have a talk, but they didn't need to. The things they were doing were sufficient. But how far back does this go? When would you say? When would you say for, first, when did you start drinking? And then when did you start to now looking at it in retrospect, would you say you began to have a problem with it? So, I mean, I started drinking at quite a young age. Both my parents are fairly heavy drinkers, although my dad has quit now. And, um, you know, we sort of uh, we drink on Sundays. It was sort of socially acceptable that if we were having, you know, we came home from church and, you know, we'd sort of have a glass of wine. And I'd say that probably started around the age of like 11 or 12. 
Um, not super frequently. I was in boarding school. So, you know, I, I'd had school in South Africa and then I would go home to my parents for the summers. Um, by the time I was 15, 16 in high school, I was definitely partying every weekend and, and drinking fairly heavily. And, and so much so that candidly, you know, I had such bad hangovers on Sundays, even as a 16 year old that I would have to draw the curtains. I would puke all day. I, you know, my body was just literally saying, hey, you're poisoning me. Why are you doing this to me? And I was very sporty and very healthy. And so, you know, I kind of wish in retrospect, I'd listened to my own body back when I was 16, but, you know, I'm a stubborn idiot. So <laughs> it took a while. It literally took, you know, like 30 years from there. Um, so I definitely, you know, I'm a high functioning, I was a high function, I'm a high functioning human, right? Like I'm a lawyer by training, you know, I, I practiced law in South Africa, I practiced law in Silicon Valley. It was the dot com days, we were partying hard all of that stuff. Um, but at some stage it went from sort of like a weekend thing or a social thing to a, I kind of need to drink a lot all the time thing. But you're saying, when you say high function, you mean that you were able to carry out the obligations of your work without interference? Yeah. You know, like I would just, I, I, uh, you know, I would just will myself. I would wake up most days with a hangover and just kind of get up and be like, you got stuff to do today. We're going to do it. And then, you know, six o'clock, you're off the clock and then you get to go have those drinks again. And so it just became very much a routine and a cycle. So we're getting to, um, so, so let's see. So, so this is starting early. And then it just becomes a, a part of your life that maybe you're not you're not sitting there examining it and thinking, maybe I'm doing too much of this. It's just part of the way you live. It's just part of the background of your life. Yeah, it's, it's background in my life, but it's also at some stage you sort of start to go, first of all, you get older, right? So, you know, I'm in my 50s now. And, and at some stage I was like, oh, like, is this going to be the landscape of my life? You know, I, I kind of you know, my parents won't like that I say this, but, you know, five, six years ago, they actually came to visit for a Thanksgiving. And I was watching the dynamic with them, both at that stage, still being very heavy drinkers, and sort of how they were interacting. And just, I, I don't know, I saw a lot there where I was like, God, man, do I want to be in my 70s and have that be my, my reality? Have that be sort of what my life is, is, you know, I get up and I do X, Y, and Z, but really, it's just all, you know, excuse to lunchtime so that we can have a drink with lunchtime. And then, you know, maybe some sherry around five. And then, you know, let's go out to dinner, you know, like all the little incremental excuses we put into to that process. And so I just started to see this, this sort of long line. And I was like, is that where I want to go? I have a lot of things I want to accomplish in life. You know, New Hampshire is not going to become its own small country if, if, you know, if I don't really get my together. And so, you know, I was looking at my parents, I was looking at some of my friends, um, I like to read. So I was definitely looking at a lot of the neuroscience behind habits addiction, uh, you know, how we can function better and higher, what am I eating, garbage in, garbage out, all of that kind of stuff. And so I just decided, you know, I sort of sat down with myself and I was like, man, can I, I just, you know what, honestly, Tom, I just grew exhausted mm. at the cognitive dissonance of both telling myself, oh, you should drink a little less, oh, you're drinking too much, and then just constantly not actually meeting those goals. So basically, you know, I was telling myself in my mind, I was telling myself something, but my actions and my thoughts were not aligned. In your blog post, you talk about the significance of consuming wine out of boxes. And that at least, you know, when you throw a box away, it doesn't make a clinking and clanging noise in the in the garbage. And and you know it's less of a rebuke to you that that you're doing it and so it seems like there was a period where in the back of your mind you had some sense that maybe this is a bit much but you would make promises to yourself you would set rules that you had to follow um but for, for some reason for, for you know maybe there are some people who can stick to rules like that you know maybe there are but not all of us can stick to those rules and maybe 
it was the case that the rules themselves and the failure to live up to them just became intolerable. Uh, that, that, that I who's in charge here? I made up these rules. Like, I'm supposed to be in charge of myself, and something else is that seems to be running my life. Yeah, and I think that's where the realization comes in that it's addiction. Um, to back up just a little bit, you know, I actually had a lot of bad habits. <laughs> um, I was a chronic nail biter. I, you know, was drinking too much. Um, I was making promises to myself or to my family members and not really keeping them. Like I was unfunctioning the way I actually wanted to. And so I'm not sure, you know, if it's a chicken and the egg, if the non-drinking led me to be able to do the other work or if the other work was tied to the alcoholism that then became something, but be it as it may, um, there's another blog post actually on my website, carlagarrick.com, that uh, the title is um, How to Change the Color of Your Aura, and it has nothing to do with auras. I don't know if auras are real, but I did have a friend who maybe saw me like three or four months after I quit drinking and very specifically said to me, hey, the color of your aura is different. What are you doing? And I was like, oh, okay. Um, but but in that blog post, actually what sort of set me down this path is I heard an interview on NPR and they were talking to an author who had written this book about the voices in your head. I think it's, um, uh, what's the guy's name? I think it's Ferriman or something, Charles uh, Fernahow. And the book is The Voices Within, The History and Science of How We Talk to Ourselves. And when I read that book, I became like hyper aware of my own thoughts. And maybe that sounds crazy. Maybe everyone else is very aware of their self-talk, both positive and negative. I think I'd just been taught or maybe from a small a young age was sort of like concerned about being crazy. And so I would suppress these voices in my head, but reading this book sort of allowed me or gave me permission to hear the voices. And suddenly I was like, man, all right. I got some nice voices, but I've got some really, really, really negative voices. And a lot of that genuinely stemmed from, you know, my upbringing, having to go to boarding school when I was 10 years old and just all of that. And so unpacking sort of my childhood allowed me to kill or at least hear and not care about that voice, that very negative voice. And because I was high functioning, um, you know, I'd be doing things and then in the back of my head, there's this like one voice kind of going, but what you're doing <laughs> isn't right. And then I chose to actually hear that voice and kind of sit with it a little and go, okay, well, you know, <laughs> I want my, I want my voices in my head, my self-talk to be positive, not negative. And what will change it so that it is that way. And then it became that realization of the alignment. Actions and thoughts must align. Otherwise, your life is not in alignment. And then I realized, oh, all habits are, right? All our life is, is how are we spending our time? And I was like, my God, I'm spending like three hours a day drinking. <laughs> you know, whether you're going to dinner with friends, of course, you're still socializing, you're doing other things. But I just realized, man, this is a big chunk of my time. And it's taking up a lot of my brain space that I could be using for other things, furthering liberty, you know, uh, writing blog posts, doing podcasts, all the positive things that I have now introduced into my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I would say that I wouldn't say that I ever had like a problem with drinking, but I will say that in graduate school, I was in graduate school at New York City. I, you know, on the weekends, it was rare for me not to drink heavily with my friends. And there was no shortage of bars in New mm. York City because I lived in Manhattan. They're all within walking distance of where I live. So it was no problem to, to get in that situation. And then you know, the next day would be typically just brutal. And occasionally it would be brutal enough for me to swear it off. But what would overcome that is just the memory of how much fun it was. And the right. fun, I would, I, you know, so the next time you're presented with that opportunity to have a drink, you're in that, you're in the moment and you're thinking about that moment. You're not thinking about the next day. You know, you're very high time preference right now, right now. Whereas now, you know, you say about being in your fifties. Well, of course I'm 50 now. I keep telling, I keep mentioning this on the show because I'm still somewhat traumatized by it. 
I know it's a big number. It it's, is it's insane. Kind of a, That's I, right. Oh, wait, and the I'm thing is, by the way, I expected that by the time I got to be 50, I would be all decrepit and, you know, I, everything would ache and, and it's nothing like that at all. I feel like I'm 20, you know, just right, the other day, too. by the way, my daughter got a uh, electric powered scooter, like a Vespa thing the other day. And so that thing goes pretty fast. And so she was mockingly and jo very jokingly and affectionately asking me to race with her. And I stayed right with her on that thing. And she was shocked. Yeah, the old man still got it. Well, anyway, at 50, I at least found that the equation inverted, that that the fun was just not worth the aggravation of the next day. It just, yeah, forget it. I just, I just don't feel like doing it anymore. But so in your case, were there moments like that, maybe with particularly bad hangovers or anything, where you had that moment where you said, I just can't do this anymore, but then the next opportunity comes and it's too hard to turn up? Yeah, I mean, that happened chronically for, for probably a decade. I mean, for a decade, I think I was literally being, you know, my mind was like, oh, I want to drink less. And then the negotiation starts, right? So you're going, okay, we're only going to, we're going to go out and we're only going to have two glasses of wine. Oh, I'm going to meet these people. We're only going to have a beer. But then inevitably, because of the non-clanking boxes at the house, you know, you come home and you're like, oh, I stuck to the two there, but now I'm just going to pour a glass of wine at home. Um, so yeah, I mean, there, the, I have some epic hangover stories. I have some epic, you know, drunken stories, all of that. But for me, again, at some stage, it was just, it was the exhaustion of it, where I was just like, man, I don't actually want to spend my life having to do this negotiation and renegotiation all the time. I just felt like I had no personal integrity with myself. And the thing is, you know, if you're drinking a lot, you're making poor choices. I read a really good statement that just said, no one drives better drunk. Now that sounds super obvious to us, but honestly, that's one of the things alcohol does, right? It impairs your judgment in a way where you're like, oh, and I have literally, Tom, made this argument where I was like, well, I do drive well drunk because I learned to drink driving and I learned to drive drinking when I was 16. And therefore, you know, no, I'm an exceptionally drunk driver. <laughs> um, yeah, no, you're not, right? <laughs> Alcohol is a neurotoxin <laughs> and it's a poison. And so uh, being quite science driven, I just also had this sort of realization where I was like, well, you're kind of lying to yourself. Like if you go look at the science now, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not good for you. And of course, you know, as we go into our 50s, that means our parents and, and people we know who are older are in their 70s and their 80s now. And there is an epidemic of dementia and Alzheimer's mm. and all these mental diseases. And you have to ask yourself, where is it coming from? And then also, you know, alcohol, you know, and I'm not pro prohibition, of course, right? I believe yeah. in freedom. So everyone should make their own choices, but I do think we should be making informed choices. And if you go and look at, at, at the way alcohol is marketed now and promoted, no one, no one talks about the negative effects. No one talks about, oh, where is dementia and Alzheimer's coming from? Like everyone's just treating it like there's there's magical thing that just happens when you're old, which is not true because a lot of the old people I know who don't drink, my grandma, for example, also because I think her 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 parents, my great grandparents, were heavy drinkers. So you start to see this sort of, uh, you know, generational thing. She lived till she was 94 and she was sharp until the day she died, you know. So there does seem to be a tracking between uh, alcohol use and some of these neuro neurological diseases we're seeing developing. And I just, I don't, I lock my brain. Uh, I like to think other people, you know, can get some benefit from it. And so I was like, man, I want to like, you know, I think I'm going to live till I'm 120. And I was like, man, I've got more of my life ahead of me than currently lived. How much more can we do? What is the potential of our lives? What is the growth mindset? How do we do this? And I was like, I don't see for me personally doing it with alcohol in my life because it was detracting and not adding. Well, I don't think I ever thought I was a better driver 
Um, I've, I'm not even sure I've ever driven where I think I've, I've had too much, but but I I did think, and I still think that after a few drinks, I'm a much better debater. And the reason <laughs> is that normally, and this, this is going to surprise some people, but in a social situation, I really don't want to pick fights with people. Honestly, I just want to be a pleasant uh, guest. I, I don't, or even if I'm out at a bar and they're, you know, in our group, there are two people who see the world differently. I'm not looking to start an argument about, you know, about stuff like that. But that type of inhibition goes away with the drinking. And also, I don't want to be a show off about my knowledge. You know, well, the International Review of Law and Economics had a paper that said, like, I don't want to be that guy. But after a few drinks, I do. And so <laughs> I, I can just flatten people after a few drinks. But the thing is, this doesn't go. This relationship doesn't go on for like the more drinks I have, the more effective a debater I am. Eventually, that drops off very sharply and suddenly, so it doesn't work forever. So, but but I want to get to though to that moment where um because you you did you have talked about gradual realizations you were having, but also you, you wrote something quite poignant I think about your friends who were not having an intervention for you or anything, but things they were saying about you that made you stop and think that, that kind of got under your skin a bit. Mm. So uh, one of the tells early on, and, and this is the good and the bad of social media is social media will let you know, <laughs> you know, what they think. And, and it was trial by fire. And honestly, you know, my, my, I think that was partly yeah, with, with uh, the Free State Project, social media, I'm surprisingly shyer than people actually realize. I think my natural energy is introverted, but I grew up in a diplomatic household, so I can very easily turn it on when I need to. But, you know, I had never even held a microphone or talked to someone, you know, from a stage until the first pork fest I organized in 2009. Someone handed me a microphone and I was like, ah, <laughs> And so there was actually a combination of using alcohol as a coping mechanism to get to that stage where, oh, I'm just a little more on. Oh, okay. I'm just a little more, you know, and, and it took away or I thought it took away some of the anxiety. So what friends and people on social media were doing is everyone was sending me the wine o'clock memes. Everyone was sent, sending me the drunk Irish memes. Everyone was sending me the... Uh, you know, so I, I remember as it was coming in, having this real reaction where I was like, oh, my God, it's like, I kind of felt like, oh, no, everyone can see me. Like, I kind of thought I had this front and I was doing it well. And honestly, Tom, I was doing it well, because every time you ever met me, I was drunk. So <laughs> isn't that because, you know, when you just mentioned 2009, I was at the Liberty Forum probably in 2011. And you you were up uh, speaking at the podium, and you seemed completely in command and charming, and like you had done it forever. And so it's so interesting to me to even to go look at those clips and anything from my past. It took me a really long time to to go because I know what I was actually feeling in those moments. And I internally was feeling a hysterical sense of anxiety where like my anxiety, because also alcohol is a neurotoxin and a depressant. And so it's really important for people to understand if you suffer from anxiety and you're self-medicating with alcohol, that is a very, very bad cycle. And so I was so anxious. I would say maybe the two months before I quit, I was having like little mini panic attacks going to a four-way stop street because in my brain, it like my brain was so heightened to like some level of crazy that I'd be like, oh my God, what is going to happen if four cars stop at the stop street at the same time? I mean, it was that level of just bananas in my brain. And so I had all these rum uh, uh, ruminations and, and anxiety and just like all these little voices going, 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 in my brain. And I, I mean, I've done some work. I do yoga, I meditate, you know, all of the good stuff now. But those voices are all gone. The anxiety is all gone. And so when I say high functioning also, it's a lot of times you don't see what someone else is going through. You don't understand the underlying anxiety or the underlying issues or whatever. And so 
it, you know, it was like, oh man, I'm gonna really have to sit with this and figure out my crap because everyone who was looking was just like, oh, she's fantastic, look at her go. And I did not feel that way internally. And of course, you know, I was eating wrong, I was overweight, the weight was very much related, of course, to the alcohol use. You can't drink two bottles of wine every day for 20 years and you know, not expect those calories to go somewhere at some stage. And so I really had to, you know, listen when people started to be like, hey, you're you're like, not only you're the party girl, but hey, like you're drunk a lot. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's got to be hard. That's got to be hard. Uh, 